In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the process from start to finish that I used to make this weapon crate. If you don't care about this and just want a free weapon crate, then you should be able to find the link to the Unity Asset Store download in the description below and some texture variants up on my Patreon, so check those out. For everyone else though, here's what will be covered. I've added timestamps if you're looking for something specific. So I'll start with the summary of the modeling process for high and low poly models and what important techniques and modifiers I used. Then we'll look at unwrapping and vertex painting in preparation for baking and texturing. Then the actual baking and texturing process in Substance Painter. Next, we'll bring the textures back into Blender for testing and we'll create the rig and idle opening and closing animations. Then we'll export the model for use in Unity bring it into Unity and wire up the animations, as well as code the interaction to open the crate. And finally, we'll take a look at making use of VFX graph to create a little visual effect when the crate opens. A good way to start is by bringing in a character from your game and using it to scale the object. I found that just above the knee is a good place for a weapon crate. I find it much easier to work on a small quadrant of the object to do this, we can create two loop cuts in the X and Y axes and delete all the vertices except those in the front left quadrant. Then we can add a mirror modifier, enable both the X and Y axes and turn clipping on. I want to add a 45 degree cut to the corner of the model. We can do this with a bevel that has a value of 0.1. So hit Ctrl B and then 0.1. If you don't get a nice 45 degree angle, just like me, then that means you probably haven't applied your transforms. So in object mode, hit Ctrl A and apply all transforms. And then back in edit mode, when you apply your bevel, you should have a good 45 degree angle. I wanna add a skirt to the bottom of the weapon crate. To do this, I'll add a horizontal loop cut drag it closer to the bottom, and with the new faces selected, I'll hit Alt-E and extrude along face normals. I think a value of 0.5 will do. For more detail, I want to add a band around the base part of the crate. I'll create two loop cuts with Ctrl R and then scroll wheel up once to add a second cut, then S to scale down on the Z axis a little, and then select the faces and Alt-E to extrude along the face normals. And again, I'll use a value of 0.5. To make the front look a bit more interesting, I'll add two vertical loop cuts. Because of the bevels though, the vertices aren't aligned. So I'll fix that by selecting the vertices and scaling them by zero on the X axis. Next, I'll select the edges that I wanna scale and then scale them up on the Z axis until they look a bit more interesting. But before that, I'll just turn cavities on so that we can see the edges a bit more clearly. And then I'll go ahead and scale that up. The next challenge is to create the inside space of the crate. We can't just extrude the top face downward because we won't have any wall thickness. And if we try to extrude, escape and then scale, we get this weird scaling. So what we really need is an inset that doesn't inset the back edge as that would create a wall inside our crate. To do this, we can temporarily inset the face, then select the middle edge and move the cursor to it. Then we can change the pivot point to the 3D cursor. And this time when we extrude, escape and scale, we get a nice inset face. We can also clean up these misaligned vertices by turning on vertex snapping and just moving them along the x-axis. And finally, we can select this new face and extrude it downward to create the space inside our crate. Whilst I have this face selected, I'm just going to duplicate it and move it upward to create the lid of the crate. Maybe scale it in a bit and then separate it by hitting P and then separate by selection. Now that I have more than one object, I'll just name things so that I know what's going on. It's also important to use the suffix high for your high poly models. 
This will help substance when we do our baking a little bit later. With things correctly named, I'll hide the lid object and start thinking about bevels. Let's add a bevel modifier. We can minimize the mirror modifier for now and then increase the number of segments and bevel amount. And turn on smooth shading. We can also turn on auto smooth and then turn on harden normals in the bevel modifier to correct any weird shading that's going on. We can also fiddle with the shape a bit to see if we can find something that suits the model. To be honest though, I've fiddled with these settings back and forth so much, but there always seems to be weird artifacts in places and the only way I've really found to make things look better is to use bevel weights and manually apply weights to the relevant edges. To do this, change the limit method to weight and then select some edges and hit Ctrl E and then Edge Bevel Weight. And then you can drag the mouse outward to increase the bevel amount or inward to decrease the bevel amount. There is a fair amount of trial and error and back and forth with this method. So I'm just gonna time lapse through the rest of me sorting out where the correct bevels should be and what the bevel weights should be. With our base in a good place, we can bring back our lid, extrude it up a little and add a bevel modifier to get some smooth edges. We'll need to turn on smooth shading, auto smooth and harden normals to fix any shading issues and then correctly weight the bevels once more. And with that, our high poly model is looking really good. But the big problem we have now is that, well, it's a high poly model, so it has way too many triangles, around 11,000 of them, which is way too much for just a prop. I've gone ahead and created two collections, one for our high poly and one for our low poly models. And what we're going to do is duplicate the high poly models and move them into the low poly collection, rename them with the suffixes low. Now, in the low poly model, we're going to delete the bevel modifier and then attempt to scale it in such a way that it fits inside of the high poly model. Why do we need to do this? It's so that we can get away with having the detail of the bevels by baking them into a normal map without actually having the triangles. And if we take a look at how Substance Painter's Baker works, it raycasts inward from a virtual envelope through the high poly model toward the low poly model to figure out the low and high points and calculates the normal data accordingly. The best way I've found to scale this is to select the faces on their relevant axes and move them inward or outward based on their current position. So for these outer faces, I'll move them 0.05 on the X axis and for the inner faces, I'll move them negative 0.05 on the x-axis. Similarly, for the upper faces, I'll move them negative 0.05 on the z-axis, and the lower faces, positive 0.05 on the z-axis, and I'll repeat this for all the faces on the model until we have our low party model inside of the high party model. I know it's a little tough to see here, but it is inside the high poly model, and I'll repeat this process for the lid of the model as well. We are now ready to UV unwrap our low poly model. An easy way to create seams for unwrapping is to select the sharp edges of the model from the select menu and mark them as seams by right clicking and selecting mark seam. I made a bit of a mess of this here because I had face select mode on. So if you want to use the sharp edges selection, make sure you have edge select mode turned on. Once the seams have been created, we can apply our mirror modifiers and remove any unnecessary edges on the models. We do this by selecting an unwanted edge, hitting X, and then saying dissolve edge. This can seem like a bit of a tedious process, but it's actually pretty relaxing once you get into the flow of things. Once all our unwanted edges have been removed, we can head to the UV editing tab, select all the objects, head into edit mode, select all the edges, right click, and select unwrap. This should create a nice looking unwrap of our model. 
I use UV Packer to optimize the UVs. It's kind of just habit right now, but for a model this simple, it's probably not even necessary. We're almost ready to export our models and start painting, but we need to do one more thing to help with the painting process, and that is to paint our vertices different colors. We do this to create a material ID map. And what that means is that we can use one material and one set of textures on our model. We just need a way to identify the different parts of it so that we can paint them accordingly. There are other ways to do this, like creating multiple materials for each part of the model that will require different paint, and then using Photoshop to combine the texture sets. But my head is already spinning using three pieces of software, so I'll stick to this method. To do this, we select the faces of the model that we want to paint separately, like the skirt of the crate for example. Then we go into vertex paint mode, select face painting, then select a color and hit shift K to paint the selected faces with the selected color. We'll go back and forth between edit mode and vertex paint mode until all our vertices have different colors. We're finally ready to export our models. We'll select our low poly models, click File, Export, FBX, make sure we have selected objects ticked. Just in case, we'll select the mesh option, we'll rename it with the suffix low for ID purposes and click Export. We can then hide the low poly models and show the high poly models. Select them and export them in the same way we did the low party models, just with the high suffix on the name. Over in Substance, I'll drag our low party model in, which will trigger the new project window. We can change the resolution to 2K and then make sure to change the normal map format to OpenGL. If not, the green channel of the normal map will be flipped and you'll have headaches for days in Blender and Unity just like I did before figuring this out. Now we can head over to the Texture Set Settings tab and scroll down to the Mesh Map section and click the Bake Mesh Maps button. Change the output size to 2K and deselect ID from the Mesh Maps. We'll handle that in a bit. Then click the button to load a high definition mesh. A frontal and rear distance of 0.1 will be alright for this bake. Turn up anti-aliasing to the max to avoid any jagged edges. Change match to by mesh name. I named my meshes with uppercase letters so I had to update those too. Then click the bake button and give it a minute to do some magic things. And look how beautiful our bake is. Our mesh with only 250 triangles looks as good as the mesh with 10,000 triangles thanks to the magic of normal maps. Before we start painting though, we need to bake in our material ID. We can head back to the Bake Mesh Map section and alt click the ID map to deselect everything else. Then we need to remove the high poly mesh that we added earlier so that the baker doesn't try to get the IDs from it. Then click the ID map and select vertex color as the color source. And with that, we have a good way to paint the different sections of our model. To paint using the material ID, we create a folder, we'll name the folder Skirt, then right click it and select Mask with Color Selection. Then using the Pick Color Selector, we'll select the material ID color that we want to paint, in this case, the skirt. Now to add color or anything else to this section of the model, we can simply add a full layer inside the skirt folder and the color will only be applied to that section. I'm gonna keep it simple and stick to a two color approach here. With a metallic orange color for the skirt, I'll make sure that only the color, roughness and metallic channels are selected for my base color layer and select the shade of orange I wanna use. Using the same technique, I will create folders for the base part, the band part and the lid part of the model respectively and use the mask with color selection option to isolate each part. Then I'll assign a darker blackish gray to the base of the model and the same orange color as the skirt to the band and the lid of the model. To make things look a bit more detailed and interesting, I wanna add a logo to the lid that looks engraved and has a black color to match the base. To the lid folder, I'll add a full layer with a black mask, which will let me paint onto it. Then I'll select the color and height channels and reduce the height to make it look like a deeper engraving. 
I'll look for an interesting alpha to use. Holding Ctrl plus Shift and dragging my mouse down, I can snap to the top view. And I'll turn Symmetry on to help me find the middle of the lid. I'll hold Ctrl and scroll the mouse wheel up to increase the scale of the alpha and find a good spot. Once I'm happy, I'll click to paint it on. And then I can just change the color to black to match the base. In a similar way, I'd like to add some engravings that will be visible from the front of the crate. So to the base folder, I'll add a full layer with a black mask Select the color and height channels. Then holding control and scrolling down on the mouse wheel, I'll reduce the size of the alpha. And once happy with the position, I'll click to paint it. Then I'll fiddle with the color and the height till I get some values I'm happy with. I think it would be cool and very Borderlands-esque if we had some status indicators on the side bevels that were glowing to let us know the crate can be interacted with. To do this, I'll add another full layer to the base folder with a black mask. I'll make sure to set the emissive channel as the only active channel though, and find a rectangle as the alpha shape. Then I'll set the spacing to somewhere around 70 or so, and then if I click once and hold shift whilst dragging my mouse down, I'll get a nice row of status lights. To make them actually glow in Substance Painter though, you will need to activate post effects and enable glare. And from the shader settings, you can increase the emission amount as you need. Following similar techniques, I'll add a status indicator to the band as a central viewpoint for the weapon crate. Substance Painter is a lot of fun and you can get extremely carried away by adding crazy effects and scratches and edge wear and a whole bunch of things. If you follow the same techniques, you'll be able to do whatever you like ready, but I'm going to keep it simple for now and this is what I think we're going to stick with. With our painting done, we can simply export our textures to a folder and we'll bring them back into Blender in a moment for testing and animation. Back in Blender, we can head over to the shading tab. I've renamed the material, which is shared by the lid and the base to Weapon Crate. You want to make sure you have the Node Wrangler add-on installed. By clicking on the principal BSDF node, then holding Ctrl and pressing Shift then T, and navigating to the folder where you exported your texture, highlighting them all, and clicking the principal texture set button, it will automatically wire up all the nodes you need, except for the emissive node. Not sure why, but anyway, we can just duplicate one of the other nodes and then wire it up the same as the others, but wiring the output into the emission node. If your emission is not showing, make sure you have Bloom enabled. Now to rig this up for animation. I'll head back into the Layout tab, Shift plus A to add an armature. I'll scale it down a bit and make sure that everything is named correctly. Then in edit mode, I'll shift D to duplicate the bone. Then rotate it 90 degrees on the X axis and move it up into the lid. Then rename it to the lid. With the lid bone selected, shift click the base bone and then control P and keep offset to parent the base bone to the lid bone. We need to set the objects to children of the bones. To do this, head into pose mode, select an object, then select the bone, and then control P and click bone. And then do the same thing for the lid. And now if we try to move the base, both the base and lid move, but if we try to move the lid, only the lid moves. 
thinking ahead to the game engine a little. I know that I'll need to wire the animations into an animation controller, and to do that I'll need a default state, which we'll make an idle animation for. We'll also need an open animation and a close animation, which will be the reverse of the open animation. We could just play the open animation at a speed of negative one, but because I want to use animation events to trigger the visual effects, it will make more sense to have separate open and close animations. I'm gonna open up an NLA window. It seems to be the easiest way to keep animations nicely organized, and I'll open up a second window for the dope sheet in action editor mode. I'll click the new action button and rename the action to idle. Go to the first keyframe and select the lid bone. With it selected, I'll move it down on the z-axis into its idle position. Once I'm happy with its position, I'll hit I to insert keyframes and select the position and rotation option which will insert the keyframes for me. I'll create a new action and call this one open. Then I'll scrub a few frames forward on the timeline, select the lid bone and move it up on the z-axis a little. Once I'm happy with its position, I'll hit I and insert the location and rotation. I'll scrub a few frames forward and duplicate the position of the lid with Shift D to keep it in place for a few frames. Again, I'll scrub a few frames forward and then move the lid bone back on the Y axis. Once I'm happy with its position, I'll hit I to insert its position and rotation. I'll scrub a few more frames forward and then rotate the lid bone on the X axis and move it down a little on the Z axis. Once I find a position and rotation that I'm happy with, I'll hit I and insert the rotation and location. I'll scrub back a bit on the timeline and hit spacebar to test out the animation. From this point, I'll just tweak the keyframe positions until I get something I'm happy with. This might be because the animation feels too fast or slow at parts, so it's just a couple of iterations of tweaking until I get something that I think looks good enough. Once I'm happy, I'll click the new action button again and rename the action to close. Then I'll highlight all the keyframes and hit S then negative one to reverse the open animation. Then I'll just move the keyframes to the correct starting location at keyframe one. And then I'll just tweak the keyframes a bit more till I get something that I'm happy with. I had a weird scenario here where the actions were not named correctly in the NLA editor for some reason, so I just deleted the NLA tracks and re-added them by selecting each action and clicking the push down button to recreate the tracks. And finally, I named all the NLA tracks correctly. To correctly orient the model in Unity so that Z is forward, I'll rotate everything on the X axis negative 90 degrees, then apply all the transforms, then rotate everything 90 degrees on the X axis again. And with that we're ready to export. I'll change the path mode to copy and embed the textures, then I'll set the active collection as what we want to export, make sure to change the apply scaling to FBX unit scale and then I will just make sure to only select NLA strips for the animations. In Unity, I've created the necessary folders for animations, materials, models and textures. So I'll just drag the model in. And then I can go ahead and drag it onto the scene to create an instance of it. I have gone ahead and added a simple FPS controller from the asset store. I'll link it down below. It's free and quite lightweight. I like to unpack the default prefab that is created when you drag a model into the scene so that I can add more stuff to it later. I'll go ahead and extract the material out of the model so that we can assign the textures and increase or decrease the emission amount as we need. Next, I'll just drag the material onto the model. I'll also bring the texture files in from where I exported them to earlier. With the material selected, I will start to allocate the textures to their required spots. An important note is to make sure that the image type for your normal map is set to normal map as if it's not, this might cause some issues with your depth. I also reduce the height to its lowest value as I don't have anything that I really want to be affected by the height map right now, but this might change in future. 
I'll also fiddle with the smoothness a little bit until I get some kind of metallic finish that I like the look of. And the last thing I want to do is increase the emission intensity a little bit so that the status lights glow. And with that we can start thinking about animating this thing. To the weapon create game object I'll add an animator component. This will need an animation controller. So in the animations folder I'll right click and create an animation controller. I'll name it something useful like weapon create. And assign it to the animator component. Then I'll double click to open it up and just dock it to the side so that we can see it in action. From our model, I'll drag in our three animations, starting with the idle animation first, then the open, and then the close animation. We're going to need a parameter to control the state of the animation. I'll call it open and it will be a boolean. We can transition from the idle to the open animation when our boolean open condition is set to true and from open to close when the condition is set to false. Once the close animation has completed, we can transition back to the idle animation. We want to set the hazard exit time to false from idle to open and to false from open to close. This way the animations can be interrupted and start playing at any point during the previous animation. I have installed Unity's visual effect graph plugin which we'll use to create our visual effect. And to create one you just right click and say create visual effect graph. I'm just going to rename it to something useful like weapon create. I'll just double click to open it and dock it next to the animator window so that we can see it in action in our scene. I'm going to keep this visual effect really simple just so that it gives you an idea of how you can use it to create some good looking effects. More of a starting point than anything else. I'll change the main texture to the default particle that you would find in Unity's normal particle system. Update the spawn to a burst. And I think a spawn amount of 20 should be fine. I'll also create an event context so that we can start this event every time we click the send button. We'll also use this later to start the event from code. I'll update the set velocity to go from a value of around negative 5 to positive 5. But playing this makes it seem like the particles go way too far out. So I think we'll just reduce that to half their current values, negative 2.5 and 2.5. And that looks a little bit better. I don't really want the particles to be alive for that long, so I'll just reduce them to a random lifetime of between 0.3 and 1. Next, I'll add a set scale that we'll use to stretch the particles out to make them look a little bit more like smoke or air escaping the weapon crates as it opens. I'll stretch it up on the X, Y and Z axis until I get something that I think looks okay. I'm just going to change the blend mode to additive to get rid of the black outline that we get on our particles. Next, I'll add some gravity so that the smoke kind of rises as the crate opens. I think that's the wrong way around, so it needs to be a positive amount. I'm also going to reduce the brightness of the particle so that it doesn't stand out as much.
Next, I'll rename the game object so that we can identify it easily in our hierarchy and I'll drag it into the weapon crate as a child. I'll also just move the transform around to a point where I think it looks okay. The script that we'll use to control all of this is really quite simple. We have references to our visual effect and our animator. And we're going to create a trigger using a collider. And when the player collides with this trigger and presses the E key, we'll start the open animation. And when the player leaves the trigger, we'll stop the open animation by setting the open parameters value to false. We'll also need an animation event that we'll call the onlid lifted function, which will start our visual effect. I'll add a box collider to the weapon create game object, set it to trigger and edit its collider. I'll drag the sides out and the front a little bit further out than the start of the weapon crate to give the player some new way to open the crate. Next, I'll drag the script into the weapon crate object. And then in the model, I'll select the open animation, scrub forward a little bit in the animation and once I find a point that I think the VFX will look good, I'll click the events drop down and click add event. And then in the function name, I'll add the on lid lifted function that I created in my script. With that, we should be done. So I'll hit the play button. And when I hit E, it opens, but no VFX played. I think that's just because I forgot to assign the visual effect to our script. So we don't actually have a reference to it. So I'll just update that real quick, hit the play button again, and we should be good to go. One more thing I did here was just remove the initial play of the visual effect so that it doesn't play on start of the game. Now, if for whatever crazy reason you found yourself at the end of this half an hour long video, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one.